Okay, so welcome to chapter two, uh, which is going to focus on the lab workflow. In chapter one, as a reminder, we just went over some uh, very basic concepts uh, that will aid us in understanding diagnostic flow cytometry in a standard clinical lab. Uh, when the specimen hits the door, uh, the specimen will go through these types of steps. There might be slight modifications in each lab, but the concepts are the same, and we'll look at them in the subsequent slides. So while uh, accessioning a specimen, when it arrives, you obviously ascertain specimen integrity, match up labels. Uh, it'll probably get some kind of a case number in your lab. And then you check for prior records. Uh, if you have done the flow cytometry before, or you have any clue about the diagnosis and what is being suspected, that is good to have, uh, particularly with minimal residual disease or follow-up uh, specimens to detect disease, it is good to have the immunophenotype of the original tumor. The next step is specimen processing. And that is uh, essentially two things. We like to make a direct morphologic preparation, either a smear or a touch imprint. Uh, and uh, th that way we can look at it under a microscope to see what type of uh, specimen it is, what might be the suspicion, particularly if you don't have that information. And then you make a single cell suspension so that uh, those cells can be stained in individual tubes. Uh, for a blood or bone marrow specimen, you would do red cell lysis so that you get the red cells out of the way. Uh, for a lymph node or tissue specimen, you'll sort of tease it out into a single cell suspension in media. Then uh, we also like to make a cytospin preparation after processing because this represents the cells that will reach the flow cytometer. So some fragile cells, large cells, some things tend to get lost between the specimen and the final uh, cytospin prep, and that is good to know. And then comes an important step where probably residents, fellows, faculty will get involved, uh, particularly in cases where there may not be enough cells or you're trying to determine a single tube to do, and that is to triage or decide the markers that you're gonna get for a particular type of specimen. Now, triaging of the markers is an important step because you don't want to get a wrong panel. Uh, these pictures remind me of uh, these nostalgic non-COVID days, <laughs> no plexiglass, no mask, that was great. Anyway, but <laughs> during the triaging process, what you're trying to see is what's the clinical suspicion, what are we seeing? Is flow the appropriate test? In some cases, uh, it may not be. You know, you have a definitive diagnosis of Hodgkin lymphoma, and now this is a bone marrow for staging. Flow is not going to be the test to do. Uh, and then we determine what panel we should get. And these antibody panels are staining combinations used in the lab. Uh, there is not any international standardization. Unfortunately, labs have to figure this out through trial and error. Different labs use different approaches, and these panels are designed to detect and characterize normal as well as aberrant populations in different types of specimens. And depending on the case, uh, you know, you can always order extra tubes if you have cells left so that an unsuspected population can be fully characterized. So this is an example of a 10 color panel that we use for a tissue type where a lymphoma is suspected. So we are talking about a lymphoma panel. And just from the markers, you can probably guess that this first tube is focused on an evaluation of T cells, their CD4-8 distribution, any aberrancy in any of the markers. And these other two tubes are focused on evaluation of the B cells, uh, where we, we'll try to find any monoclonal population and then confirm in this last tube whether uh, it might be a hairy cell leukemia based on some of these markers. So, so that, and then we have an isotopic control tube as we discussed uh, in video one. So, so that's how panels are generally designed logically, uh, what makes sense to put together and characterize the expected populations. So then once the markers are determined, then it goes back into the lab for staining so what is done is a, uh, you know, cells are now divided into, for example, in this case, if we would put them into four tubes, maybe, a, a, you know, 
million cells each, half a million, 100,000. Uh, you can go down to 50,000 if, if it's a posicellular specimen. But each tube will get, uh, get cells, and then uh, each tube would then get stained uh, based on the panel that was uh, chosen. And once it is stained and washed and fixed, usually, then those tubes go for data acquisition. Uh, in this case, it's going on to a fax canto, which can do your 10 color uh, panel that we have chosen. And then uh, you come to the data analysis stage where it can be approached in many different ways. And I will have a whole video dedicated to my soapbox opinion about how analysis should be approached. <laughs> for, for that, you'll have to wait a little bit. And then uh, in that video, we'll also see a live example of data analysis that is done in this way called cluster analysis. But the general approach in clinical labs uh, where you know, we're still not using big data type and analytic approaches is generally either you're going to do a gating type approach where there's a sequential analysis of populations making some assumptions along the way, or you're going to do a cluster analysis where all, uh, you know, it accounts for everything that is contained in the specimen, all data is available to see at all times through the analysis, and it is not necessarily focused on specific subpopulations, although in the end, both these methods can result uh, or should result in the same uh, analysis, but there are uh, drawbacks of some approaches and uh, we will do that uh, so box step speech uh, in a different video. So that's cluster analysis. That's what we use over here. Uh, it's uncommon to have this analysis and that's why I'm gonna do a whole video on that uh, to show you the beauty of this approach. So uh, what, what that is, is, you know, for example, this is four color data, six parameters. So if you, there are about 30, since we don't think in six dimensions, in the end, you're going to do a two dimensional plot. There are 30 ways to view six parameters, but really 15 productive ways because parameter one versus two on the X, Y axis versus two versus one is essentially the same plot. So there are 15 ways to view six dimensional data and then what you do is you're trying to find these clusters. And in the live example that I show you, uh, you'll understand better what I'm saying, that you can just paint this cluster. And since all six parameters were saved on all of these events, it will instantly light up in all these other dimensions. And then you can hone in using all six parameters as appropriate onto these population of blasts or monocytes or granulocytes or basophils, et cetera. So that's how cluster analysis works and uh, we will talk about it. The philosophy of our report is to account for all major populations that are contained in the specimen. In a negative study, we just enumerate all different types of population. Now, this bone marrow contains 70% granulocytes, so many monocytes, etc. In a positive study, we can describe the salient features of the abnormal population uh, so that it is helping those features are what help us reach a diagnosis. So this is different uh, than just uh, uh, doing percentages within gates and things like that. Uh, and so we will end this video too over here uh, with uh, just this thought of uh, doing cluster analysis uh, discussion later on. And I will see you in video three. <laughs>